Hi, and welcome to my video on earthquakes and the seismic cycle. As you probably know, earthquakes are responsible for thousands of deaths worldwide. A few of the most deadly recent earthquakes have been Tongshan, China in 1976, killed at least 500,000 people. Kashmir 2005, 80,000. In Haiti 2010, when a relatively small strike slip earthquake killed 223,000 people. So many of these deaths can be attributed to poor engineering and to the growth of large cities quickly within seismically active areas. Now in the United States we've been a little bit luckier. We have less seismic activity and we have much stricter building and engineering codes that have lowered death tolls in a lot of our earthquakes. Nonetheless, We've had a few big ones, San Francisco, 1906, Bay Area, 1989. And you'll notice that all three of these earthquakes are associated with the Pacific North America plate boundary. And specifically, they occur along the San Andreas Fault, which is a huge strike-slip fault that moves the Pacific plate laterally northward relative to the North American plate roughly going parallel to each other as they move at a rate of about three centimeters per year. So Pacific's moving northward at about three centimeters per year relative to North America. And here's what that looks like along the Carrizo Plain, a huge gash in the land surface. Pacific moving north, North America heading south. So one question that interests geologists is when should we expect the next big earthquake along the San Andreas Fault. And through detailed study of past earthquakes, geologists have shown that the next earthquake can probably be expected somewhere along the southern part of the San Andreas, where it cuts northward, just north of LA, and then cuts down to the Mexico border near Palm Springs, California. These two sections last ruptured in 1857 and in 1680. And so we know that these are now due for another big earthquake. And this may be very devastating because since the time of these earthquakes, of course, humans have now built huge cities. The city of Los Angeles, 8 million plus people. The city of San Diego down here and the larger LA San Diego area, almost 20 million people living immediately adjacent to the area where this fault may rupture. So how big is the earthquake gonna be? What are the impacts gonna be? This video is gonna explore that question using a lot of information and figures from the USGS ShakeOut study. This was a group of earthquake scientists who got together and developed a scenario for what the next big earthquake on the San Andreas might look like. So a lot of what you see in this video is gonna be taken from this shakeout study. And so we'll start out by teaching you what is an earthquake. Then we'll look at the ideas of earthquake recurrence interval and a strain deficit. Then we'll talk briefly about what controls earthquake size and magnitude and finish by looking at what controls the shaking intensity during earthquakes. So first, what are earthquakes? Earthquakes occur when two blocks of crust move past each other. This could be on any kind of fault, a thrust, a normal, or a strike slip. But in this video, we're gonna use the example of strike slip faulting when two blocks move laterally past each other. And so essentially what happens is during the interseismic period, the fault is locked. Okay, the plates continue to move, for example, Pacific and North America, but the fault itself is actually stuck or locked. Now, as the two plates move over time, the area along the fault gets compressed, causing a buildup of stress right along the fault zone. Eventually, that stress becomes so large that the fault slips during what's called the co-seismic period and energy is released during the earthquake. So let's take a closer look at this. How are the rocks actually compressed? We call this elastic strain, okay? 
And it's much like the compression of a spring, where a spring might be extended and then may be compressed, essentially storing elastic energy that can later be released. So let's have a look. Here's a strike slip fault. And we're going to watch as the area right along the fault gets compressed during the interseismic period. And then eventually the fault will rupture, and the elastic strain will be released right there, sending off seismic waves. And now we're going to watch as those waves shake the trees and the ground as they radiate out across the ground. So that's a pretty typical scenario for where energy comes from during an earthquake. So now let's look at earthquake recurrence. How often do earthquakes occur? And what controls that? So recurrence interval is defined as the average time between earthquakes. And it's determined by two factors. One is the long-term rate of plate motion. How fast are the two plates moving relative to each other? And that determines how quickly we can build up strain and load that spring that you just saw. So in this case, the Pacific plate's moving at 3 centimeters per year relative to the North American on the other side of the San Andreas Fault. And so the second thing that determines recurrence interval is the stress required to rupture the fault interface. Okay? And we've talked a lot about stress and strain in our previous videos, so feel free to have a look back at those if you need a reminder. But essentially, with elastic strain, as we squeeze that spring, the stress gets higher. And so as the plates move and more time elapses, the rock gets squeezed more and more, and the stress gets higher and higher until it exceeds the strength of the fault, and the fault actually ruptures. So what does this stress buildup look like over time? And how does it lead to a seismic cycle or an earthquake cycle? Well, here's what happens. If time is going forward along the x-axis here, and this is stress along the fault plane, we essentially, when the fault is locked during the interseismic period, stress builds up along the fault plane. And then it reaches some critical stress that we'll call tau 1. And it exceeds the strength of the fault, and it causes an earthquake. Zoom. And the stress is now dropped down to some background level. And you can see that the, the slip along the fault, or the offset, went from being nothing during the interseismic period, and then the fault moves abruptly right during the earthquake. But now the cycle repeats itself. The fault becomes locked again. And during the, the, the next interseismic, it doesn't move at all. And of course, stress builds again until eventually that critical stress is reached again, and we get another earthquake. Boom. And the stress drops as the faults lurch past each other, the plates lurch past each other. And then we repeat that buildup of stress again and drop down to the background level. So essentially, each time we have an earthquake, the clock is reset as the stress drops back to some background level. And then the stress continues to build as the plates continue to move with a locked fault in between them. So in ideal cases, this can yield what's called a characteristic earthquake. A characteristic earthquake is one that has a constant size and a constant recurrence interval. So we get the same magnitude earthquake every 100 years, for example. And this implies two things. One that the plate motion is constant over time, that the plates on opposite sides of the fault are moving steadily, allowing stress to build up at a constant rate. And second, it implies that the critical stress, or the strength of the fault, is essentially constant. In other words, it takes the same amount of stress to induce an earthquake each time. So if these two things are true, we might get a characteristic earthquake and that's interesting to geologists because it implies that the earthquake could maybe be predictable if we're lucky. So let's bring it back to the San Andreas and look at a couple examples. The most famous example of a characteristic earthquake 
is along the Parkfield section, which is roughly halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Along this section, we get a magnitude 6 earthquake every 22 years. And you can see that in the data here. Here's time, and then here's the various earthquake events plotted against time. And so what this means is that the fault plane here is very weak and that the critical stress to trigger an earthquake is roughly constant. So as the plates move, we reach that critical stress roughly every 22 years, and we get a very small, predictable earthquake. And that's actually a good thing. We'd much rather have a lot of small earthquakes releasing the stress and strain than to have it build up over hundreds of years and have one very destructive and unexpected earthquake. So we love fault zones that behave like the park field segment. But what I guess we love even more is the next section just to the north, and that's called the creeping section of the San Andreas. And this is a section that has no earthquakes on it at all. The fault essentially moves, or I should say it has very, very small earthquakes. The fault essentially moves steadily at the plate rate. So what this means is that the critical stress or the fault strength is very low, and that the fault actually essentially doesn't become locked. It just creeps slowly. So it's a nice weak fault zone that doesn't actually build up any elastic strain at all. So I want to wrap up this section by introducing the idea of a strain or a slip deficit. So if, if we look along the San Andreas Fault, we know that the two plates, North America and Pacific, are moving roughly the same rate all along the San Andreas Fault. But you now know that the northern part of the fault, for example, the creeping section, is essentially steadily releasing all that strain. It's keeping up with the plate motion. But you also know that if we go to the southern part of the fault zone, we haven't had a big earthquake since 1857. And actually, the fault zone in that area is still locked. And it's been locked for almost 200 years now. So this is called a slip deficit. What we know is that we're building up strain, elastic strain, along the southern part of the fault zone. And we know that because the whole fault has to move at the same rate over a long time scale. And we know that that, that rate hasn't been accommodated in the southern part due to the locking. So slip deficits can be very, very dangerous. They suggest that st elastic strain is building up and that that energy and displacement is going to be released as an earthquake at some point in the future. OK, so now let's shift gears and look a little bit at the size and the magnitude of earthquakes, and specifically, what size and magnitude might we expect if this section of the southern San Andreas Fault ruptures? So there's really four factors that control the size of earthquakes. The slip distance during an earthquake, the rupture length, or the distance along the fault that actually slips, the locking depth, or the depth that ruptures, and the strength, or the stickiness of the fault zone. And each of these four factors is really controlled by a lot of other things. For example, the slip distance during an earthquake is controlled by how far the plates have moved and how much elastic strain has accumulated during the interseismic period. The rupture length has a lot to do with the fault type. Is it a subduction zone? Is it an extensional fault or a strike-slip fault? And what's the geometry of the fault? Locking depth is very interesting. It's really controlled by the brittle to ductile transition, or the point in the crust where it goes, where strain goes from being accommodated in a brittle fashion, or breaking, to a ductile fashion, or flowing. And that's really controlled by temperature and rock type. Please see our previous videos if you want more information about that. And then finally, the strength of the fault. What controls that stickiness? That's a subject of a lot of active research. Could it have to do with the smoothness or the mineralogy or the presence of water? Lots of factors may control how 
how frictioned or how sticky a fault zone is. But these are the four factors that control the size of an earthquake. So for example, bringing it back to our Southern California example, the USGS shakeout scenario predicts roughly 300 kilometers of offset if these two fault zones rupture together at the same time. They suggest a locking depth of about 10 to 15 kilometers in a slip distance of about 2 to 7 meters depending where you are along the fault. And so how do they know this number of a 10 to 15 kilometer depth? Much of that comes from looking at small earthquakes along the San Andreas. And they can see that the brittle to ductile transition happens at a depth of roughly 10 to 15 kilometers. That's where the crust goes from behaving brittly and giving us a lot of small earthquakes to flowing in a ductile way or where we have no earthquakes. So if we wrap all this information up for the Southern San Andreas, we can actually estimate the energy released during this hypothetical earthquake. And we do that using what's called the seismic moment. And that's given to us by the shear modulus, or the strength of the fault, times the, the rupture length, times the rupture depth, times the co-seismic slip distance. And if we put all these things together in meters, shear modulus and pascals, we get out a number that's in joules, roughly 5.8 times 10 to the 20 joules. How much is that? It's a lot. Roughly enough, if you were to convert that somehow to electricity, that could power all of California for about four and a half days. So a huge amount of energy released during this earthquake. And so most of us don't think in terms of moment. We've been raised to think in terms of magnitude. So we can go one step further and convert that seismic moment, or m naught into a moment magnitude, which is something roughly akin to the Richter scale. And we do that by plugging the moment magnitude here in units of dyne centimeters into this equation. And we get out a magnitude 7.8 for our Southern California earthquake, roughly what's predicted by the shakeout scenario. So what does that mean? If we get a magnitude 7.8 earthquake in Southern California, what's the intensity of shaking going to be like, say, for somebody who lives in Los Angeles? And let's have a, let's have a look at this. So shaking is also described as ground motion. Okay, How quickly is the ground accelerating? or what is its peak speed that it's going to reach, okay? That's how we think about, about the intensity of shaking. And there's two causes of ground motion during an earthquake. One is local ground acceleration on the fault block. So this is going to be places that are immediately adjacent to the San Andreas. So here's the San Andreas running here, okay? This is the part that's going to rupture. And notice we get a lot of this red shaking intensity right along the San Andreas, where the two blocks of crust are actually physically lurching forward during the earthquake. And notice this is going to be uh, a peak acceleration of about almost 1 g, so really pretty high. And then the other cause of high ground motion is the passage of seismic waves. We're going to see in a second that waves radiate out uh, from the energy released along the fault, and they're going to radiate over here and be amplified within the sedimentary rocks of the Los Angeles Basin. So now I want to illustrate this with a computer simulation of an earthquake along the southern San Andreas that was performed as part of this USGS shakeout study. So this is on YouTube, and we're going to click over and take a look at this. So I want you to notice a couple things. The earthquake is going to nucleate down here near the Mexico border, and it's going to move northward. Okay, Here it comes. We get the fastest P waves moving out ahead. And notice as the rupture actually moves relatively slowly up along the fault, a little bit slower than the seismic waves themselves. We can think of this as the fault unzipping. Literally, the, the fault up here hasn't even ruptured yet. The slip is advancing as the fault unzips to the north, okay? 
But now here come some seismic waves being released off the center part of the rupture. Watch as those envelop the Los Angeles basin here. And watch as intense red shaking hits the Los Angeles basin. You can see some of this shaking skirting along the mountain front through Pasadena and get really intense shaking within the Los Angeles basin and also within some other basins to the north of Los Angeles. So I want to finish this video by showing you one more clip from an earthquake. And what this is going to show you is the ground motion recorded by a GPS monitor during the Nepal earthquake in, the tw in 2015. And what you're going to see is that the city of Kathmandu is also located in a sedimentary basin that greatly amplified the shaking during the earthquake. And so what you're going to see is people walking in the courtyard prior to the earthquake, okay? And then this dot is going to start to move east, west, and north, south as the earthquake hits. Here we go. Here comes the first southward shake as the first wave hits. Notice the people moving south also. And then back to the east and back to the west. And you can start to see the scale of this motion. This is one meter. And then this little circle orbital in here is about half a meter. So the ground continues to resonate and shake back and forth by half a meter in either direction for almost a minute as that, those weak sediments resonate. Pretty terrifying and amazing that this was captured by a GPS positioning system. So thanks so much for listening. In summary, faults are locked during the interseismic period and they slip during the co-seismic period or during earthquakes when the two plates move past each other. The recurrence interval of earthquakes is determined by how fast the plates are moving and what the critical stress is that needs to be overcome to cause an earthquake on the fault. We might get a characteristic earthquake if these conditions are constant, and that would have the same size and the same recurrence interval each time. If certain parts of the fault are locked and they're not releasing the elastic strain, we could get what's called a slip deficit along a section of the fault that hasn't released its built up strain. Ultimately, the size of an earthquake is determined by the length and depth or the rupture area, the slip distance or the offset during the earthquake, and the strength or the stickiness of the fault zone. We just saw in that last video that it takes time for an earthquake rupture to actually migrate along a fault zone. And as it migrates and it becomes unzipped, it releases seismic waves. And we get the worst shaking right along the fault trace or as those seismic waves resonate with nearby sedimentary basins. Thanks so much for listening. Here's a few concept questions, and I'll see you in class.